The manufacturer and storage of explosive chemicals is a recipe for disaster if done incorrectly. And this would be the case in 1988 when an explosion would affect an area of roughly a 10 mile radius. If you like what we do here at Plain Difficult, help the channel grow by liking, commenting and sharing. And if you haven't already, subscribing. Let's get cracking on with the video. PEPCON is a word that has popped up in the comment section of several videos. Not 100% knowing what it was, I looked into a few reports on the subject and oh man, this is one big of an explosion. Oh. Today, I'm going to rate this incident here on the plane of difficult disaster scale. It's scary to think that sparks from welding can cause a fire that led to an explosion and destruction on this scale. But I suppose the result is pretty obvious when the site that the fire started in was one of two major producers of ammonium perchlorate worldwide, which is a key component in rocket fuel, and we know how explosive that can be. The Pacific Engineering and Production Company of Nevada, or PEPCON for short, operated in Clark County, Nevada, approximately 10 miles southeast from downtown Las Vegas, near the city of Henderson, which is around here on a map. Oddly, the other major ammonium perchlorate producer was only under two miles away and was operated by Care McGee. The PEPCON plant was constructed in the 1950s in an at the time isolated desert area. However, the area would see growth in the 1970s due to the expansion of Las Vegas's metropolitan sprawl. The nearby city of Henderson in the late 80s had a population of around 50,000 people. The PEPCON facility specialised in the manufacture of oxidizer ammonium perchlorate, which was used in the Space Shuttle program, SLBMs launched from nuclear submarines and other rocket programs. The buildings on the eight acre site were mostly steel framed with fiberglass walls. And also randomly, the plant's next door neighbour was a marshmallow factory. The plant manufactured the AP in a four step process starting off with the electrolytic oxidation of sodium chloride to sodium chlorate in the chlorate building. Then the electrolytic oxidation of sodium chlorate to sodium perchlorate happened, also in the chlorate building, followed by a reaction between the sodium perchlorate and ammonium chloride to produce ammonium perchlorate in agitator tanks within the process building. The final step being AP crystallization, filtration, dyeing, screening and the blending to customer specifications in several buildings. A tragic turn of events would eventually lead to the incident in 1988 and this was the Challenger shuttle disaster. This happened on the 28th of January 1986 where the space shuttle exploded killing all seven crew members. Subsequently all NASA launches were grounded whilst the investigation was undertaken. This however left a problem for PEPCON who now had a larger than normal stockpile of rocket oxidizer. This would end up being stored in several hundred aluminium bins and several thousand plastic barrels. The classification of AP in 1988 was a class 4 oxidizer and hadn't been detonation tested in large scale quantities leading to a full sense of security. It was estimated that a total of 8.5 million pounds were on the site in 1988, which is roughly around 3.8 million kilograms. The site was not set up well for storing large amounts of combustible materials. The only building to have a sprinkler system was the main offices and no proper fire alarm was installed on site. No official evacuation plan was in place at PEPCOM beyond get out if you encounter a big fire. This brings us on to the 4th of May 1988. Now, there are several different theories to the initiation of the disaster, but I'm going to side with the NASA report. On the day, 77 employees were at PEPCON, one of whom was mobility impaired in a wheelchair. At 11.30 a.m., employees were repairing the plant's drying structure, which had wind-damaged steel and fiberglass segments. Sparks from a welding torch ignited some of the fiberglass. The workers attempted to extinguish the fire with a hose. Residual AP was on the structural parts of the building, and this fueled the spread. The fire continued on to reach some of the AP stored in plastic drums. The employees who were fighting the flames abandoned the effort when extinguishing was doing little to help. 75 of the staff on site by this point had already started to evacuate the danger area, some on foot and others in their vehicles. 
One of the staff members had stayed behind to alert the authorities of the impending doom, and the other, the person in the wheelchair, was unable to evacuate. Eventually, the inevitable happened and the temperature rose to a level to start an explosion, and around 20 minutes after the initial ignition, disaster struck. The explosion spread the flames further around the site, eventually reaching the aluminium containered AP, intensifying the fireball. After around four minutes, a second larger explosion engulfed the Pepcon facility, leaving barely anything behind. Henderson City's fire chief saw the huge plume of smoke 1.5 miles away from the facility and ordered all units to make their way to launch any possible rescue efforts. He reached a nearby site as the explosions were happening. Responding fire trucks were also caught up in the explosions, injuring many of the first responder firefighters. The shockwave from the second explosion had caused significant damage with vehicles, buildings and window glass all mangled up from the intense release of energy. A 15 feet deep by 200 feet wide crater was left at the Pepcon epicentre. Other nearby fire departments also arrived to assist with the injured first responders. The decision to not attempt to fight the remaining fire was made as further explosions posed too great a risk. The smoke from the explosion reached several thousand feet into the air and was spread over the town of Henderson. Five more smaller explosions erupted as individual stores of AP combusted. The two main explosions were registered as 3.5 on the Richter scale all the way in California. It would be later estimated that the second explosion would be the equivalent yield of one kiloton of TNT, about 120th the yield of the Trinity test. The only remains of the site was a flame plume created when a high pressure natural gas line beneath the plant was ruptured during the explosions. A five mile exclusion zone was set up around the facility, evacuating all within, making use of almost every public service available, including the Henderson Police Department, Nevada Highway Patrol, Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department and the Nevada National Guard. Around an hour after the first explosions, it was concluded the airborne products would be a respiratory irritant, but not highly toxic. Cases of respiratory issues were reported as far as 30 miles away. The fire eventually petered out after the natural gas line was cut off just before 12 noon, allowing initial inspections of the site to be undertaken to assess the risk of further explosions. For the beginning of remediation works, crews had to wear protective clothing and respirators due to the leaking chemicals and the airborne irritants from the explosion. The initial work proved difficult, with no supply of water meaning everything had to be trucked in from nearby Henderson. Of the 100 employees for Pepcon and a nearby marshmallow factory, between 20 and 30 needed hospital treatment with varying injuries. It took six hours to account for everyone on the site and all was accounted for apart from two. These two missing persons were the wheelchair user and the other who had stayed behind to report the incident. They were the only fatalities of the disaster. This was not the end of the story's effects sustained by the disaster however. An estimated 300 further people were injured in the surrounding area from falling debris, broken glass from the shockwave and other materials released by the explosion. The emergency services advised the hospitals in the local area to activate their disaster plans, however the vast majority of the injured persons were minor. The overflow of patients led to triage being undertaken in the car park at nearby St Rose de Lima in downtown Henderson. The damage affected a radius of around 10 miles, including broken windows and doors ripped off their hinges. At McCarran Airport in Las Vegas, windows were cracked and doors were pushed open and the shockwave affected a Boeing 737 on final approach. Pepcon had only a $1 million liability insurance policy, and this would obviously not be enough to cover the damage caused by the disaster. Needless to say, this would result in a lawsuit between multiple lawyers and insurance companies, and would result in a 1992 settlement of $72 million. The disaster opened the eyes of the regulators and industry officials to the risk of AP, and the site today has been developed into a retail area. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you'd like to support the channel financially, you can on Patreon from $1 per creation, and that gets you access to votes and early access to future videos. I have YouTube membership as well from 99 pence per month, and that gets you early access to videos. 
Check me out on Twitter, and also if you want to wear my merch, you can purchase it at my Teespring store. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching.